This is part three of James P. Cannon's History of American Trotskyism. So chapter three, the beginning of the left opposition. The last lecture brought us up to about the year 1927 in the Communist Party of the United States. The fundamental struggle between Marxism and Stalinism had been going on inside the Russian Communist Party already for four years. It had been going on in the other sections of the Comintern too, including our own, but we didn't really know it. The issues of the great struggle in the Russian party were confined at the beginning to extremely complex Russian questions. Many of them were new and unfamiliar to us Americans who knew very little about the internal problems of Russia. They were very difficult for us to understand because of their profound theoretical nature. After all, up to that time, we had had we had had no really serious theoretical education and the difficulty was increased by the fact that they that we were not presented with full information we were not supplied with the documents of the russian left opposition their arguments were concealed from us we were not told the truth on the contrary we were systematically fed with misrepresentation distortion and one-sided documentation I make this explanation for the benefit of those who are inclined to ask, why didn't you at the very beginning take up the banner of Trotskyism? If things are so clear now to any serious student of the movement, why couldn't you in the early days understand it? The explanation I've made is one never considered by people who view these great disputes separate and apart from the mechanism of party life. One who bears no responsibilities, who is a mere student or commentator or sideline observer does not need to exercise any caution or restraint. If he has doubts or uncertainties, he feels perfectly free to express them. That is not the case with a party revolutionist, one who takes upon himself the responsibility of calling workers to join a party on the basis of a program to which they are to devote their time, their energy, their means, and even their lives has to take a very serious attitude toward the party. He cannot, in good conscience, call for the overthrow of one program until he has elaborated a new one. Dissatisfaction, doubts are not a program. You cannot organize people on such a basis. One of the strongest condemn condemnations Trotsky leveled at Schachtman in the early days of our dispute on the Russian question in 1939 was this, that Schachtman, who began nursing doubts as to the correctness of our old program without having in his mind any clear idea of a new one, went through the party irresponsibly expressing his doubts. Trotsky said, a party cannot stand still. You cannot make a program out of doubts. A serious and responsible revolutionist cannot disturb a party merely because he has become dissatisfied with this, that, or the other thing. He must wait until he is prepared to propose concretely a different program or another party. That was my attitude in the Communist Party in those early years. For my part, I felt great dissatisfaction. I was never enthusiastic about the fight in the Russian Party. I could not understand it. And as the fight grew more intense and the persecutions increased against the Russian left opposition, represented by such great leaders of the revolution as Trotsky, Zinoviev, Radek, and Rakovsky, doubt and dissatisfaction accumulated in my mind. This militated against my position and against the position of our faction in the endless conflicts within the Communist Party. We were still trying to solve things on an American scale, a common era. I think one of the most important lessons that the Fourth International has taught us is that in the modern epoch, you cannot build a revolutionary political party solely on a national basis. You must begin with an international program and on that basis, you build national sections of an international movement. This by way of digression was one of the big disputes between the Trotskyists and the Brandlerites, the London Bureau people, Pivert, et cetera who advanced the idea that you can't talk about a new international until you first build up strong national parties. Strong national parties. According to them, only after having created formidable mass parties in the various countries, 
Could you federate them into an international organization? Trotsky proceeded in just the opposite way. When he was deported from Russia in 1929 and was able to undertake his international work with free hands, he propounded the idea that you begin with an international program. You organize people, no matter how few there may be in each country, on the basis of the international program. You gradually build up your national sections. History has given its verdict on this dispute. Those parties which began with a national approach and wanted to push aside this problem of international organization all suffered shipwreck. National parties could not take root because in this international epoch, there is no longer any room for narrow national programs. Only the fourth international, starting in each country from the international program, has survived. That principle wasn't understood by us in the early Communist Party. We were engrossed in the national struggle in America. We looked to the Communist International to give us help with our national problems. We did not want to bother with the problems of the other sections or those of the Comintern as a whole. This fatal error, this national narrow-mindedness, is what pushed us into the blind alley of faction struggles. Things began to grow very critical for us. None of the factions wanted to split or leave the party. They were all loyal, fanatically loyal, to the Comintern and had no thought of breaking with it. But the discouraging internal situation grew worse, appeared hopeless. It became obvious that we must either find a way to unite the factions or permit one faction to become predominant. Some of the wiser ones, or rather, some of the more cunning ones, and those who had the best sources of information in Moscow, began to realise that the way to gain the favour of the Comintern and thereby place the great weight of its authority on the side of their faction was to become energetic and aggressive in the fight against Trotskyism. Campaigns against Trotskyism were ordained from Moscow in all the parties of the world. The expulsions of Trotsky and Zinoviev in the fall of 1927 were followed by demands that all the parties immediately take a position with the implied threat of reprisals from Moscow against any individual or group failing to take a correct position. That is in favor of the expulsions. Campaigns of enlightenment were carried on. The Lovestoneites were in the vanguard of the fight against Trotskyism. Thereby they purchased for themselves the support of the Comintern and enjoyed it throughout that period. They organized enlightenment campaigns. Membership meetings, branch meetings, section meetings were held all over the party to which representatives of the Central Committee were sent in order to enlighten the membership on the necessity for the expulsions of the organizer of the Red Army and the chairman of the Comintern. The Fosterites, who weren't as quick and cunning as the Lovestoneites, but who had a good deal the same will, followed suit. They really ran races with the Lovestoneites to show who were the greatest anti-Trotskyists. They vied in making speeches on the subject. Looking back on it now, it is an interesting circumstance, which rather foreshadows what was to follow, that I never took part in, in, in any of these campaigns. I voted for the stereotyped resolutions, I regret to say, but I never made a single speech or wrote a single article against Trotskyism. That was not because I was a Trotskyist. I didn't want to get out of line with the majority of the Russian party and the Comintern. I refused to take part in the campaigns only because I didn't understand the issues. Bertram D. Bertram D. Wolf, Lovestone's chief lieutenant, was one of the greatest Trotsky baiters. At the slightest provocation, he would make a speech two hours long, explaining how the Trotskyists were wrong on the agrarian question in Russia. I could not do that because I didn't understand the question. He didn't understand it either, but in his case, that wasn't so much of an obstacle. The real objective of the Lovestoneites and Fosterites in making these speeches and carrying on these campaigns was to ingratiate themselves with the powers in Moscow. Someone may ask, why didn't you make speeches in favor of Trotsky? I couldn't do that either because I didn't understand the program. My state of mind then was that of doubt and dissatisfaction. 
Of course, if one had no responsibility to the party, if he were a mere commentator or observer, he could merely speak his doubts and have it over with. You can't do that in a serious political party. If you don't know what to say, you don't have to say anything. The best thing is to remain silent. The Central Committee of the Communist Party held a plenum in February, the famous February plenum of 1928, which followed a few months after the expulsion of Trotsky and Zinoviev and all the leaders of the Russian rep of the Russian opposition. A big campaign was already on to mobilize the parties of the world to support Stalin's bureaucracy. At this plenum, we fought and disputed over the factional issues in the party, the estimate of the political situation, the trade union question, the organization question. We fought furiously over all these questions. That was our real interest. Then we came to the last point on the agenda, the Russian question. Bertram D. Wolf, as the reporter for the Lovestoneite majority, explained it at great length for about two hours. Then the question was thrown open for discussion. One by one, each member of the Lovestone and Foster factions took the floor to express agreement with the report and add a few touches to show that he understood the necessity for the expulsions and was in favor of them. I didn't speak. Naturally, because of my silence, the other members of the Canon faction felt somewhat constrained from speaking. They didn't like the situation and organized a sort of pressure campaign. I remember to this day how I sat at the back of the hall, disgruntled, bitter and confused, sure that there was something phony about the question, but not knowing what it was. Bill Dunn, the black sheep of the Dunn family, who was at that time a member of the political committee and my closest associate, came back with a couple of the others. Jim, you have got to speak on this question. It is the Russian question. They will cut our faction to pieces if you don't say something on this report. Get up and say a few words for the record. I refused to do it. They persisted, but I was adamant. I am not going to do it. I'm not going to speak on this question. That was not wise politics on my part, although in retrospect, it may appear so. It was not an anticipation of the future at all. It was simply a mood, a stubborn personal feeling that I had on the question. We didn't have any real information. We didn't really know what the truth was. By that time, 1927, the disputes in the Russian party had begun to embrace international questions. The question of the Chinese revolution and the Anglo-Russian committee. Almost any member of our party can tell you now what the problems of the Chinese revolution were because since that time, extensive material has been published. We've educated our young comrades on the lessons of the Chinese revolution. But in 1927, we provincial Americans didn't know anything about it. China was far away. We never saw any of the theses of the Russian opposition. We didn't understand the colonial question too well. We didn't understand the profound theoretical issues involved in the Chinese question and the dispute which followed. So we couldn't take a position honestly. The Anglo-Russian question seemed a little clearer to me. That was the question of the great struggle between the Russian opposition and the Stalinists over the formation of the Anglo-Russian committee a committee of Russian and English trade unionists, which became a substitute for independent communist work in England. This policy throttled the independent activity of the English Com Communist Party at the crucial moment of the general strike of 1926 in that country. Quite by accident in the spring of that same year, I had come across one of the documents of the Russian opposition on that dispute, and it had a profound influence on me. I felt that at least on this question of the, the Anglo-Russian committee, the oppositionists had the right line. At any rate, I was convinced that they were not the counter-revolutionists they were pictured to be. In 1928, after the February plenum, I made one of my more or less regular national tours. I had the habit of making at least one tour of the country from coast to coast each year, from coast to coast every year or every two years. So as to get a breath of the real America, to get the feel of what was going on in America. 
Looking back at it now, you can trace many of the unrealistic ideas and mistakes and much of the, and much of the narrow-mindedness of some of the party leaders in New York to the fact that they'd lived all their lives on the island of Manhattan and didn't have the real feel of this great diversified country. I made my 1928 tour under the auspices of the International Labor Defense and prolonged it four months. I wanted to get a bath in the mass movement away from the stifling atmosphere of the everlasting faction fights. I wanted an opportunity to think out a few things on the Russian question, which troubled me more than anything else. Vincent Dunn has reminded me more than once that on my way back from the Pacific coast, when I stopped in Minneapolis, he and comrade Skoglund asked me, among other things, what I thought of the expulsion of Trotsky and Zinoviev, and that I answered them, who am I to condemn the leaders of the Russian revolution? Thereby indicating to them that I was not very sympathetic to the expulsion of Trotsky and Zinoviev. They remembered that when the fight broke out in the open a few months later. In the late spring and early summer of 1928, the Sixth World Congress of the Comintern was called in Moscow. We departed for Moscow as usual on such occasions in a big delegation representing all the factions. Going there, I am sorry to say, not preoccupied with the problems of the international movement, which we as representatives of one section might help to solve, but all of us more or less preoccupied primarily with our own little fight in the American party, going to the World Congress to, to see what help we could get to fry, our, to fry our own fish here at home. Unfortunately, that was the attitude of practically everybody. On departing for the Congress, I didn't have any hope of getting a real clarification of the Russian question, the dispute with the opposition. By that time, it appeared that the opposition had been completely wiped out. The leaders were expelled. Trotsky was in exile in, Alma, in Almata. All over the world, what sympathizers they may have had were thrown out of the party. There seemed to be no prospect of reviving the question, but it continued to bother me nevertheless. And it bothered me so much that I couldn't take a very effective part in our faction fight in Moscow. Naturally, we continued the faction fight when we got there. We immediately lined up our delegations in caucuses and began to see what we could do to cut each other down, drawing up mutual accusations and endlessly debating the thing before the commission there. I was a more or less sullen participant in the, in the business. Just about that time, they began to apportion the commissions. That is, the leading members of each delegation were appointed to various commissions of the Congress, some on the Trade Union Commission, some on the Political com Commission, some on the Organization Commission. In addition, there was the Program Commission. The Sixth Congress undertook to adopt for the first time a program a finished program of the Comintern. The Comintern was organized in 1919 and up to 1928, nine years later, it still had no, fi no finished program. That doesn't mean that in the early years, there was a lack of attention and interest in the question of the program. It simply is an indication of how seriously the greatest Marxists took the question of the program and how carefully they elaborated it. They began with some basic resolutions in 1919. They adopted others in 1920, 1921, 1922. At the fourth Congress, they had the beginning of a discussion on the program. The fifth Congress didn't pursue the question. Thus, we came to the sixth Congress in 1928, and we had before us the draft of a program which bore the authorship of Bukharin and Stalin. I was put on the program commission, partly because the other faction leaders weren't much interested in the program. Leave that to Bakaran. We don't want to bother with that. We want to get on the political com commission, which is going to decide about our faction fight, on the trade union commission, or some other practical commission, which is going to decide something about some little two by four trade union question worrying us. Such was the general sentiment of the American delegation. I was shoved onto the program commission as a sort of honor without substance. And to tell you the truth, I was not much interested in it either. 
but that turned out to be a bad mistake, putting me on the program commission. It cost Stalin more than one headache to say nothing of Foster, Lovestone and the others. Because Trotsky, exiled in Almata, expelled from the Russian party and the Communist International, was appealing to the Congress. You see, Trotsky didn't just get up and walk away from the party. He came, he came right back after his expulsion at the first opportunity with the convening of the Sixth Congress of the Comintern, not only with a document appealing his case, but with a tremendous theoretical contribution in the form of a criticism of the draft program of Bukharin and Stalin. Trotsky's document was entitled, The Draft Program of the Communist International, a Criticism of Fundamentals. Through some slip up in the apparatus in Moscow, which was supposed to be bureaucratically airtight, this document of Trotsky came into the translating room of the Comintern. It fell into the hopper where they had a dozen or more translators and stenographers with nothing else to do. They picked up Trotsky's document, translated it, and distributed it to the heads of the delegations and the members of the program commission. So lo and behold, it was laid in my lap, translated into English. Maurice Spector, a delegate from the Canadian party and in somewhat the same frame of mind as myself, was also on the program commission and he got a copy. We let the caucus meetings and the Congress sessions go to the devil while we read and studied this document. Then I knew what I had to do and so did he. Our doubts had been resolved. It was as clear as daylight that Marxist truth was on the side of Trotsky. We made a compact there and then, Spectre and I, that we would come back home and begin a struggle under the banner of Trotskyism. We didn't begin the fight in Moscow at the Congress, although we were already thoroughly convinced. From the day I read that document, I considered myself, without a single wavering doubt thereafter, a disciple of Trotsky. Because we didn't raise the fight in Moscow, some purists on the sidelines might again demand, why didn't you take the floor at the Sixth Congress and speak up for Trotsky? The answer is, we couldn't have best served our political ends by doing so. And that is what you are in, po in politics for, to serve ends. The Comintern was already pretty well Stalinized. The Congress was rigged. For us to have disclosed our complete position at the Congress would probably have resulted in our detention in Moscow until we were cut to pieces and isolated at home. Lovestone, when his time came, was later caught in this Moscow trap. My duty and my political task as I saw it was to organize a base of support for the Russian opposition in my own party. In order to do that, I had first to get home. Therefore, I kept quiet at the Stalinized Congress. Frankness among friends is a virtue. In dealing with unscrupulous enemies, it is the attribute of a fool. At that, we weren't too cautious in keeping our sentiments hidden. I, especially, was considered more and more as monkeying with Trotskyism. Gitlow has re related in his pathetic ghost-written book of repentance that the GPU had checked on my activities in Moscow and had reported to the Comintern that Cannon, in talks with Russians, had disclosed that he had strong Trotskyist leanings. They had me under suspicion, but hesitated to proceed against me too brusquely. They thought that maybe they could straighten me out and that this would be much better than to have an open scandal. They had good reason to assume that I would make a scandal if it came to an open fight. So eventually we came back home, I think in September, with nothing solved so far as the faction fight in the American party was concerned with nothing solved so far as the faction fight in the American party was concerned. The Lovestoneites had gained a few inches in the fight in Moscow, but at the same time, Stalin had included some qualifications in the resolution, which laid the basis for getting rid later or for getting rid later of the Lovestoneites. I had smuggled Trotsky's criticism of, of the draft program out of Russia, bringing it home with me. We came back home and I proceeded immediately with my determined task to recruit a faction for Trotsky. You may think that was a simple thing to do, but here was the state of affairs. Trotsky had been condemned in every party of the Communist International and once again condemned by the Sixth Congress as counter-revolutionary. 
Not a single member in the party was known as an outspoken supporter of Trotskyism. The whole party was regimented against it. By that time, the party was no longer one of those democratic organizations where you can raise a question and get a fair discussion. To declare for Trotsky and the Russian opposition meant to subject yourself to the accusation of being a counter-revolutionary traitor and being expelled forthwith without any discussion. Under such circumstances, the task was to recruit a new faction in secret before the inevitable explosion came, with the certain prospect that this faction, no matter how big or small it might be, would suffer expulsion and have to fight against the Stalinists, against the whole world, to create a new movement. From the, ver from the very beginning, I had not the slightest doubt about the magnitude of the task. If we had permitted ourselves any illusions we would have been so disappointed at the results that it might have broken us up. I began quietly to seek out individuals and to talk to them conspiratively. Rose Kasner was my first firm adherent. She never faltered from that day to this. Schachtman and Aburn, Aburn, who worked with me in the International Labour Defence and were both members of the National Committee, though not of the political committee, joins me in the great new endeavor. A few others came along. We were doing quite well, making a little headway here and there, working cautiously all the time. A rumor was going around that Cannon being a Trotskyist, a, a, a rumor was going around about Cannon being a Trotskyist, but I never said so openly and nobody knew what to do about the rumor. Moreover, there was a little complication in the party situation, which also worked in our favor. As I have related, the party was divided into three factions, but the Foster faction and the Cannon faction were working in a block and had at that time a joint caucus. This put the Fosterites between the devil and the deep sea. If they didn't expose hidden Trotskyism and fight it energetically, they would lose the sympathy and support of Stalin. But on the other hand, if they got tough with us and lost our support, they couldn't hope to win the majority in the coming convention. They were torn by indecision and we exploited their contradiction mercilessly. Our task was difficult. We had one copy of Trotsky's document, but we but didn't have any way of duplicating it. We didn't have a stenographer. We didn't have a typewriter. We didn't have a mimeograph machine and we didn't have any money. The only way we could operate was to get hold of carefully selected individuals, arouse enough interest, and then persuade them to come to the house and read the document. A long and toilsome process. We got a few people together and they helped us spread the gospel to wider circles. Finally, after a month or so, we were exposed by a little indiscretion on the part of one of the comrades and we had to face the issue prematurely in the joint Foster Cannon Caucus. The Fosterites raised it in the form of an inquiry. They'd heard so-and-so and they wanted an explanation. It was clear that they were greatly worried and still undecided. We took the offensive. I said, I consider it an insult for anybody to cross-examine me. My position in the party has been pretty clearly established now for 10 years and I resent anybody questioning it. So we bluffed them for another week. And in that week, we made a few new converts here and there. Then they called another meeting of the caucus to consider the question again. By this time, Hathaway had returned from Moscow. He had been to the so-called Lenin school in Moscow. In reality, it was a school of Stalinism. He'd been all smartened up in the Stalin school and knew better how to proceed against Trotskyism than the local shoemakers. He said the way to proceed is to make a motion. This caucus condemns Trotskyism as counter-revolutionary and see where everybody stands on the motion. We objected to this on the ground, dissimulatingly formalistic, but a necessary tactic in dealing with a police-minded graduate of the Stalin school, that the question of Trotskyism had been decided long ago and that there was absolutely no point in raising this issue again. We said we refused to be a party to any of this folder roll. We debated it four or five hours 
and they still didn't know what to do with us. They faced this dilemma. If they became tarnished with Trotskyism, they would lose sympathy in Moscow. If, on the other hand, they split with us, their case would be hopeless so far as getting a majority was concerned. They wanted the majority very badly and they nourished the hope, oh, how they hoped, that a smart fellow like Cannon would eventually come to his senses and not just go and start a futile fight for Trotsky at this late day. Without saying so directly, we gave them, we, we gave them a little grounds to think that this might be so. Decision was postponed again. We gained about two weeks with this business. Finally, the Fosterites decided among themselves that the issue was getting too hot. They were hearing more and more rumours of Cannon, Schachtman and Arburn pros proselyting, proselyting party members for Trotskyism. The Fosterites were scared to death that the Lovestoneites would get wind of this and accuse them of being accomplices. In a panic, they expelled us from the joint caucus and brought us up on charges before the political committee. We were given a trial before a joint meeting of the PC and the Central Control Commission. We reported that trial in the early issues of the militant. Naturally, it was a kangaroo court, but we had full, sco we had full scope to make a lot of speeches and to cross-examine the Fosterite witnesses. That was not because of party democracy. We were given our rights because the Lovestoneites, who were in the majority in the political committee, were anxious to compromise the Fosterites. In order to serve their purposes, they gave us a little leeway and we made the most of it. The trial dragged on day after day. More and more party leaders and functionaries were invited to attend until we finally had an audience of about 100. Up till then, we hadn't admitted anything. We confined ourselves to... We had confined ourselves to cross-examining their witnesses and tarnishing and compromising the Fosterites and one thing and another. Finally, when we were tired of this, and since the report was spreading throughout the party of what was going on, we decided to strike. I read to a hushed and somewhat terrified audience of party functionaries a statement wherein we declared ourselves 100% in support of Trotsky and the Russian opposition on all the principled questions and announced our determination to fight along that line to the end. We were expelled by the joint meeting of the Central Control Commission and the political committee. The very next day, we had a mimeographed statement circulating through the party. We had anticipated the expulsion. We were ready for it and struck back. About a week later, to their great consternation, we hit them with the first issue of the militant. The copy had been prepared and a deal made with the printer while we were dragging on the trial. While we were dragging on the trial. We were expelled on October 27, 1928. The militant came out the next week as a November issue, celebrating the anniversary of the Russian Revolution, giving our program and so, giving our program and so forth. Thus began the open fight for American Trotskyism. We certainly didn't have too bright a prospect to begin with, but we gained steadily in the first weeks and built firmly from the outset because we started right. We broke the logjam of unprincipled factionalism in the party with a charge of dynamite. With just one blast, we rid ourselves of all the old errors and mistakes of the American party factions where we put ourselves on the ground of a prince when we put ourselves on the ground of a principled program of internationalism we were sure of what we were fighting about all the old, all the little organizational machinations that had loomed up so big in the old squabbles were just thrown off like an old coat we began the real movement of bolshevism in this country the regeneration of american communism it was not too promising a struggle from the point of view of numbers. The three of us who signed the declaration, Aburn, Schachtman and myself, felt pretty lonely as we walked down to my house to lay plans to build a new party that was to take power in the United States. All three of us had been working for the ILD. 
We were immediately thrown out of there with back wages coming to us and not paid. We didn't have any money at all and didn't know where we could get any. We planned the first issue of The Militant before we knew how we were going to pay for it. But we made a deal with the printer to give us credit for one issue. We wrote to some friends in Chicago who sent us some money and we got out the paper. We announced proudly that it was going to be published twice a month. So it was. Very shortly after we were thrown out of the party, we discovered a group of Hungarian comrades who had been expelled from the party for various reasons in the factional struggles a year or two before. Independently of us, unknown to us, they'd come, they'd come into contact with some Russian oppositionists working in AMTORG, the Soviet commercial agency in New York, and had become, and had become convinced Trotskyists. They certainly looked like an army of a million people to us. We found a little group of Italian oppositionists in New York, followers of Bordiga, not really Trotskyists, but they worked with us for a while. We conducted a quite energetic fight. We answered accusations militantly. We began to circulate new material, material we began to circulate new material of the Russian opposition through the militant. Trotsky's criticism of the draft program, and so on. Soon one could see the beginning of the crystallization of a faction that had a future before it because it had a clear principled program. While it was a small faction for a long time, it was a very convinced and fanatical and determined faction. We began to gain recruits throughout the country. Our most important big acquisition was from Minneapolis. Minneapolis has played a role not only in Teamsters strikes, struggles, but also in building American Trotskyism. We gained supporters in Chicago. We were badly handicapped in many respects. We hadn't had time prior to our expulsion to communicate with the party members outside New York very much. The first that most comrades in the Communist Party knew about our position was the news that we had been expelled. The crude tactics of the party leadership helped us a great deal. Their method was to go up and down the country, putting a motion in every committee and branch to approve the expulsion of Cannon, Schachtman and Aburn. And everybody who wanted to ask a question or to get more information was accused of being a Trotskyist and expelled forthwith. That helped us a whole lot. They pushed such comrades right into a position where we could at least talk to them. In Minneapolis, it, in Minnesota, where we had good friends of long association, the Commissar of the Lovestone Gang summoned them to a meeting and demanded an immediate vote on a motion to approve our expulsion. They refused. We want to know what this is. We want to hear what these comrades have to say. They were immediately expelled. They communicated with us. We supplied them with the documentary material, the militant, etc. Eventually, practically all those who had been expelled for hesitancy in voting to confirm our expulsion became sympathetic to us and most of them joined us. We emphasized from the very beginning that it is not simply a question of democracy. The question is the program of Marxism. If we'd been content to organize, if we had been content to organize people on the basis of, discon of discontent with the bureaucracy, we could have gained more members. That is not a sufficient basis, but we utilized the issue of democracy to get a sympathetic hearing and then immediately began pounding away on the rightness of Trotskyism on all the political questions. You can easily imagine what a tremendous shock our stand and expulsion were to all the party members. For years, it had been drilled into them that Trotsky was a Menshevik. He had been expelled as a counter-revolutionist. Everything had been turned upside down. The minds, of the, the minds of the helpless members had been filled with prejudices against Trotsky and the Russian opposition. Then out of a clear sky, three party leaders declare themselves Trotskyists. They're expelled and immediately go to the party members wherever they can find them and say Trotsky is right on all the principled questions and we can prove it to you. That was the situation with which a good many comrades were confronted. Many of those expelled for hesitating to vote against us didn't want to leave the party. They didn't know anything about Trotskyism at that time 
and were more or less convinced that it was counter-revolutionary. But the stupidity of the bureaucracy in throwing them out gave us a chance to talk with them, to confer with them, supply them with literature, etc. This created the basis for the first consolidation of the faction. In those days, every individual loomed up as enormously important. If you have only four people to start a faction with, when you can find a fifth one, that's a 25% increase. According to legend, the Socialist Labour Party, way back in the old days, once made a jubilant announcement that in the election they doubled their vote in the state of Texas. It turned out that instead of their usual vote of one, they had obtained two. I will never forget the day we got our first recruit in Philadelphia. Soon after we were expelled, while the hue and cry was raging against us in the party, there came a knock on my door one day, and there was Morgan Stern of Philadelphia, a young man but an old Canaanite in the factional fights. He said, we heard about your expulsion for Trotskyism, but we didn't believe it. What is the real lowdown? In those days, you didn't take anything for good coin unless it came from your own faction. I can remember to this day going into the back room, getting out the precious Trotsky document from its hiding place and handing it to Morgie. He sat down on the bed and read the long criticism. It is a whole book from beginning to end without stopping once, without looking up. When he finished, he had made up his mind and we began to work out plans to build a nucleus in Philadelphia. We recruited other individuals the same way. Trotsky's ideas were our weapons. We ran the criticism serially in the militant. We had only the one copy and it was a long time before we were able to publish it in pamphlet form. Because of its size, we could not get it mimeographed. We had no mimeograph of our own, no typist, no money. Money was a serious problem. We'd all been deprived of our positions in the party and had no incomes of any kind. We were too busy with our political fight to seek other jobs in order to make a living. On top of that, we had the problem of financing a political movement. We could not afford an office. Only when we were a year old did we finally manage to rent a ramshackle office on Third Avenue with the old L roaring in the window. When we were two years old, we obtained our first mimeograph machine and then we began to sail forward. 